Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Off the Shelf, the podcast where we take our books off of our shelves and into our hearts. And today and this month, I'm here to continue the introduction we shared last time on graphic novels. Mostly, I'll be trying to stay pretty general about my feelings on why graphics have suddenly kind of exploded in popularity and why they can and should be taken seriously as a legitimate and meaningful form of media and an expression of our culture, of ourselves. First, though, to take us back for a moment to our focus titles for the month, I'm going to give a little bit more background information on the authors of each of our book club picks for October, dish just a little bit into where these stories are coming from, and share my first impressions of each of them. Of the three authors we're reading from this month, the only of the three I'd read anything from previously is Rainbow Rowell. She writes books for many ages and many audiences, but really began her career as a news columnist before moving on to publish novels. Her debut, an adult fiction romance called Attachments, was released in 2011 and gained almost immediate attention from Kirkus Reviews. Now, it could be my age influencing my perspective, But I really feel like it was her young adult fiction which really put her into the spotlight in the book pop culture scene. First, Eleanor and Park in 2012, followed by Fangirl in 2013. For her next book, she returned to the scene of adult fiction with Landline in 2014, and after that, back to young adult fantasy to write The Companions, the books within the book, to her previous young adult work, Fangirl the Simon Snow trilogy, beginning with Carry On in 2015. She's also written short stories, both solo and as a part of larger multi-author anthologies, and more recently moved into the realm of comic books and graphic novels, as we see from our read this month, Pumpkinheads. Aside from her bibliography, though, there isn't a huge amount of information on her in my quick initial research. Basically, good old Wikipedia tells us that she is a mother, she's American, and like a Pisces, And on her own website, her Frequently Asked Questions page shares that yes, Rainbow is her legal first name, and yes, she plans on continuing to write more for both adults and teens. Apart from there, I think we can learn and discern a lot about her from her work, though. Maybe above all else, Rowell writes about people's connections with each other and about the love that can sometimes grow between them. She writes about how that love can turn sour when communication isn't fostered and brought to the forefront in our relationships. She writes about people who are right for each other but so often meet at the wrong time, and people who are wrong for each other but happen to meet at a convenient time that they read as being the right time. And she writes about people who try to make things work even when the world seems to want to work against those efforts to the best or worst of outcomes. She writes about people who want to help people, and people who don't necessarily want to be given that help even when they need it, and she writes about how we all might be a little bit better off if we let down just a hint, just a tad of that guard we so carefully normally keep up around us. In short, in my opinion, she writes about a lot of things that matter to a lot of people. It's not hard to see why she's gained so much popularity in such a short time, especially with the young adult audience, a group of people, of readers who so often feel very deeply and don't always know how to put those feelings into words. Speaking from my own experience, I think that sometimes writers like Roel serve to put those difficult to explain feelings to words, to articulate them, and then of course to make them easier to handle once we can see all of their sharp corners and edges and find the ways we might work around them. Some of her work has also gained the wrong type of attention. After the release of Eleanor and Park in particular, a parent group at a school in Minnesota tried to have the book banned from their library's shelves after their kids, who were students at the school, selected it as their school district's summer read. Inspired by how much the book had meant to so many of them, the kids nominating the book encouraged all of the high school students in the area to share reading the book. They organized a huge event and even invited Roel to attend, but once a few parents caught word of the book's content, what many of them considered too profane and too dangerously obscene, both of those, by the way, being direct quotes, they tried to shut it all down. This particular parent group has a pretty infamous reputation for trying to censor content for children and teens in their area, especially LGBT plus content or themes concerning sexuality in general, for example. But they aren't the only ones who challenged Eleanor and Park. 
Since then, the book has been on hot coals with a number of different school districts to lesser and greater degrees and success. Fortunately, the book and Roel's other works have garnered more support than hate, and luckily she doesn't seem like one to step back from working on topics and themes that she cares about, and especially when they do matter to so many people and especially so many teens. She honestly seems like such a powerhouse of a lady, and I have a lot of respect for her. It's not easy to face so much flack and just keep going, and maybe not everyone would, but I'm glad that she has. Faith Erin Hicks, on the other hand, I don't really know that much about. It actually came as a surprise to me that I am familiar with some of her other works, particularly the Nameless City graphic trilogy, which I haven't actually read but I have perused through and sold to other people at my work, as well as her most recent release, a graphic novel titled Ride On, which I also don't know a whole lot about, but remember seeing the cover and putting on a list for review to potentially bring into my work this fall. Hicks is a two-time Eisner award-winning author-artist, and one living in Vancouver, which was also a pleasant surprise. I always get a little bit excited and proud every time I find out an author is Canadian. I don't know. She went to school for animation and worked for a number of years in the industry before moving into being a full-time comic creator. Between the years of 2009 and 2020, as her website's bio shares, she produced more than 10 graphic novels, some of them solo works and some collaborations with other authors. She seems like a very down-to-earth and cool person, and a very, very busy person, and I'm excited to see where she goes next. She writes, it seems, mainly for the middle grade and young adult audiences, and even better, her work is reliably good and quality, both in terms of story and artwork. Personally, for myself, something that's really important when I'm reading a graphic novel is that I like the art that goes into it. If the art style isn't something I enjoy looking at, I... I just can't make myself continue to look at it. I think that there is so much out there in terms of graphic novels right now, especially for that middle grade age group, and it can be so hard to parse through and find the best of the format, but I'm glad to know and to be becoming more familiar with every day the names to really watch out for. My first impressions of Pumpkinheads are not too organized yet, but I'm already kind of in love with it. To remind you, in case you haven't gotten a chance to pick it up, or if you've decided to pick up something different this month, this book follows two best friends, Josiah and Deja, who only see each other for one season out of the year, in the fall, when they work at the pumpkin patch together. On their last night of the season, which is doubling as their last ever shift together, as they're both in their senior year and won't be returning the following year, Deja decides that they need to go out with a bang, to see everything they haven't gotten to see, and to do everything that they haven't always gotten to do, including having Josiah talk to the girl at the fudge shop he's been crushing on for years and never gotten to know. The story follows the two as they ditch their work post for the night and embark on this quest to do all the things, to see all the sights, to try all of the snacks, which turns into a bit of a wild goose chase, and everything possible, it seems, just wants to go wrong. Everything about the book so far kind of feels like a fall comfort meal to me. The friendship and the kind of snarky love between the two main characters, but especially the way that the pumpkin patch itself kind of feels like a character. With the powerful dynamics between the different seasonal workers and the different locations in the patch, I really feel like I could be right in there with them every autumn, or even like I already had been there in previous years. It actually reminds me a lot of a heritage site that I grew up visiting almost every year, especially for school trips, called Fort Steele. I never worked there, but I know a lot of people who did, dressing up in period clothing, playing the parts of old-timey teacher or farmhand or blacksmith or gold tanner. And honestly, even just going there was always such an experience. Maybe because we're all 100% sure that that place was haunted to the limit. Or maybe because there's just something about being in a place that has so much character preserved and fostered and celebrated. Especially when that place has a staff that also embrace that character so strongly. Like at any job, of course, there will be ups and downs, and many reasons why the workers might really struggle some days to embrace it. But when it works, when everything unifies, it can be such a beautiful and enjoyable thing. I think maybe what I love most about the book so far is that I feel that through Josiah and Deja and the other workers, we are really given 
that insider's view of working in a place like that. And that gives a whole new perspective on those ups and downs. What all goes into making such a united front believable and fun, even when there's so much going on behind the scenes. I also keep thinking about how fun of a short film this book would make, and I think that's in part due to its format as a graphic. Sometimes, especially for short books or short stories, I find it really hard to envision everything as it happens because we get so little time with the characters and the setting before the action has to take precedence. That's not the case here at all. Even though we're moving at a run throughout the story, and even though there's this impending sense of time on the characters' minds, and having it run out before they can do everything they need to do, I'm finding a lot of peace in the panels that don't have any words. I get this sense that even though Josiah feels like he's racing against the clock on his last night working at the patch, the nature of the patch itself, the mind and the perspective of it that we're let into seeing, has something to say too. And that is that even though Josiah and Deja feel that everything in their world is going to change, that isn't completely true. I also get that really strong feeling of Hogwarts will always be there to welcome you home, you know? It doesn't matter how long it's been or how far they go, or if they really do never see one another again. The patch will always be there, and to a certain extent, this part of it that the two kids have grown up with and grown together with, it will always be theirs, Josie's and Deja's. Something the book is saying to me, and what I think the patch is trying to say to Deja and Josie, is that everything might change, but only if you let it. The book is all about taking chances and being spontaneous and doing the things you've always held yourself back from doing. And for me personally, it hits really close to home. I'm young and I'm beginning to understand just how important that lesson really is. Who cares if you do something and it doesn't work out? You move on, but you don't get anywhere and you can't really move on if you never try and you never know if it all might have worked out for the better. This book is kind of everything I'm hoping for in a light, fall, flicky read. I'm really excited to dig in a little more with you on it next time. But for now, I'll move on to our second read for the month, Garlic and the Vampire by Brie Paulson. Brie Paulson is a relatively lesser known author, I guess, but I personally adore everything I've seen from her since discovering her work. Garlic and the Vampire is her debut published solo work, but prior to this, she has worked on personal webcomics and illustrated children's books with Zist Publishing, a house now based in Texas. The sequel or companion to this book, titled Garlic and the Witch, is out now, and she's currently working on a new graphic novel for middle grade readers, according to her website bio. Her art style to me is something really quite special and quite on trend right now. If, say, the words cottagecore and maybe woodland gothic aesthetic mean anything to you, then you might already have an idea of where I'm going, and her website actually says it best, quoting, she loves to draw silly vampires, monsters, and various veggies, unquote. Her style is spooky, but in a silly way. It contrasts itself in a lot of ways, combining the mundane with the mystical, and it's so much fun to look at. If I had any artistic ability whatsoever, then I would want to draw things as fun as she draws them. I really, truly encourage you to look into her art further if the work she's done in Garlic and the Vampire is something that you find as delightful and fun as I find it, or if anything I've said without you even looking at the book sounds interesting and intriguing and exciting. She's got a lot on her website, her portfolio page at www.vampiresandwhimsy.com, and I had a great time looking through it. Aside from these couple of facts, though, there isn't much readily available that I can find on her. I'm super excited to see where she goes from here, and I hope to see her work and her fame really blossom. To refresh us all, Garlic and the Vampire is a really sweet little story about the little garlic bulb who didn't really believe she could, but went for it anyway, and as it turns out, she could. She really could. Garlic is a gardener, before all else, given consciousness by Witch Agnes like the rest of the Vegetable Gardener companions, and she's perfectly happy to lend a hand in growing the witch's new and future crops in any way she can. She leads a pretty quiet life, and she's convinced herself that she likes it that way, but there are these moments, a few choice seconds, where we see that there's something else in Garlic. Something like an adventurous streak, or maybe just an adventurous spirit that's never had much chance to see the light, just waiting in the wings for the right moment. The vegetables live in a relative peace, 
selling the crops they helped to grow in the market each day and helping to make a living for the witch Agnes, who gave them the gift of sentience and life. One day, suddenly though, the vegetables notice something a bit off, a bit different. There's a plume of smoke coming from the chimney of a far-off castle. The witch puts it in their minds that long ago a vampire lived in those towers, and she warns them that it might be the very same, returned from his long absence. The vegetables fret and panic, and unanimously agree that nervous, anxious, unwilling little garlic, with her natural protection from vampires, should be the one to go and confront the vampire, and even to end him if that's what it takes to keep them all safe from his evil. Though initially apprehensive, Garlic agrees that maybe this is what she was meant to do all along, and she hesitantly agrees at her best friend Carrot's encouragement to go. As I've kind of already said, everything about this story to me is just so, so wonderfully wholesome. From the art style to the protagonist to the actual story and illustrations and the easy creativity that inspires it, and the punny but also sort of secretly sometimes dark sense of humor that comes with it. I already love it, every bit of it. I love the way that such a fun tale can incorporate such an important message about self-esteem and bravery without being at all overbearing or preachy. One aspect of the book I really appreciate so far is the way that it handles anxiety, exposes the way that it can so often be self-inflicted, and offers the possibility that overcoming it can be so incredibly rewarding. Pumpkinheads dives into the idea of just going for it, whatever your brain tells you for or against the idea. And Garlic and the Vampire does the same, but from a very different angle. Garlic claims that gardening is her number one, and I don't doubt it necessarily, but we do see these moments where she breaks, and she seems to let the other dreams that haunt her and even maybe scare her a bit in for moments at a time. She thrives with positive reinforcement and external validation, and honestly, in this way, I relate to her so much. And I hope you know that my saying that, that I relate to a little bulb of garlic, is maybe the strangest thing I've ever said, but that doesn't make it any less true. Paulson has created for us such a lovely little story with a powerful message about courage, and thinking about that message and this story, it's maybe only the second or third time I've been quite so emotional about a bunch of vegetables. I don't know, but I'm a vegetarian and I watched a lot of Veggie Tales when I was younger, so maybe I've grown up predisposed to love everything about this cute little book. I hope that you share my love this month. Graphic novels kind of evolved from the comic book, but it has been so much a process and there has been so much development and growth there that it's a bit difficult to really pinpoint where the biggest changes came about. There are a lot of books out there being classed as graphic novels without necessarily fitting each and every criteria, and there's a lot of gray area, I think. Basically though, the last 10, maybe 15 years have been a bit of a breeding ground for the production of the format. There is so much out there, so much original content as well as reproductions of the same stories found in traditional novels, and it's honestly a lot of work to sift through what's good, what's not anything special, what people will like or not, what works, and what's trying too hard to be something that's already popular, that's already been popular, and which kind of takes over the opportunity for any successors in the near future. The format gets a lot of love and also a lot of flack for an assortment of reasons. But to put it quite plainly, only some of either their promotions or their criticisms are really worth noting. I talk about graphic novels a lot at my work because I think they've shown a lot of real potential to grow new avid readers, something that I felt as a kid was kind of in a short supply. Graphics didn't really gain a lot of speed until I was into later middle school and maybe even into high school. For kids my age who either struggled with reading itself, with comprehension, with paying attention long enough to get into a book without pictures, or even just to find a book they could really get into, there weren't nearly the number of options I feel there are today. There were always comics and manga, but they seemed to appeal to a very targeted and very specific crowd, and they didn't have nearly the reputation or garner the same respect that many graphics do today. Part of that is just because of the way that our canon has evolved, how exponentially our definition of what real literature is has expanded. But part of it too is just due to the absolute proliferation of diversity in the format as a whole. 
Generally, the way I look at it is this, and this is what I tell parents who are uncertain of the value of their kid's specific interest in graphic novels. First of all, as a person who has read a lot of them, there are some really good ones out there. Secondly, and maybe more importantly, if graphic novels make reading fun for kids instead of being a chore, then the content of the book doesn't matter as much as the habits they're developing through reading them. This goes for adults too. If graphic novels are, for lack of better terms, kids' gateway drugs to getting into reading, then they have inherent value. If they encourage them further to pick up full traditional novels, then that's awesome. But that isn't, or maybe it shouldn't be, the only goal. Maybe graphics aren't as difficult or as challenging as novels, but who cares? The facts don't lie. They still improve literacy and comprehension skills, and they still hit the mark for what I think is one of the major goals of reading and literature, connecting people over words and the emotions and the feelings loaded into those words, fostering empathy and understanding, and developing our culture. For a society in which fewer and fewer kids and teens and adults are reading for fun, I think it's crazy important that we encourage it in whatever shape or form it comes to us and to start as early as we possibly can. I'll talk crap about Dogman or Cat Kid because they're an easy sell at the store, but even I have to admit that they're doing what a lot of books haven't been able to do for a long time. They're getting kids to pick up books again. Let's not waste the hope that that offers us. For today, that'll be the end of my rants, I promise. I hope that if you haven't already, that my thoughts have inspired you to give graphic novels a chance. And I hope that before we meet here again on Off the Shelf, you've maybe even found a new favorite. Thank you so much for joining me here today, and I hope to connect again soon with you. And so until next time, take good care and happy reading. The Off the Shelf podcast is a proud member of the Ordinary Podcasting Network. To learn more about this podcast or the network, please visit ordinarypodcast.com. Finally, thank you for listening, and if you haven't already, please subscribe or leave us a comment. Thank you so much, and take care.